Good evening and welcome to the Skasa and Gunner Short webinar on the India-China breakthrough where we're going to discuss military aspects. This is going live to all uh, viewers and subscribers of Claus also. Uh, so far, we've been talking of a uh, lot of things about the India-China breakthrough on the LAC and the uh, Z Modi meet. But we're not focused on the military aspects, and that's what we're going to do today. And to talk us through all this for the next hour or so, I have a very, very, very competent panel. So first, let me welcome all of them. Yeah. Thank you. There comes uh, General Pannu. So we have General Gautam Murthy, General Rakesh Sharma, who commanded 14 Co, uh, which on the LAC, General Dushyant, who was in the Eastern Command, so he's going to cover the Eastern Command aspects, and General Pannu, who will give an overview, though he's also commanded the same corps as General Rakesh, I request General Pannu to give the overview, so that there's no overlap of opinion. Right. Uh, I'll not make, I'll not give many uh, opening remarks and all that, because we've been going through this for the past one week. Uh, I'll straight away request General Gautam Murthy, sir. Please tee off. Good evening, General Shankar. Good evening, my fellow panelists. Uh, good evening, viewers. Jaihan to all of you. Uh, this, as you said, we are focusing strictly on uh, military aspects. Uh, there's no doubt that this breakthrough uh, that has taken place in Russia is, uh, is a long drawn out process in, in all domains. Let us not forget what uh, came about. How did it come about? It took four and a half years of intense and extensive negotiations. It involved 31 rounds of diplomatic talks through the WMCC, that is the Working Mechanism for Consultation and Coordination on India-China Border Affairs. It included 21 rounds of military talks at the core commander level. So apart from our external affairs minister, the Chinese foreign minister meeting every time, our foreign minister kept, uh, our external affairs minister kept emphasizing the urgency of resolving outstanding issues along the line of actual control. The culmination of this effort reflects a concerted push from both sides to stabilize our relationship. And why did this happen? Chinese deployments in Eastern Ladakh in April 2020, heightened tensions. So at the, at the very least, what we can say today is that the downward spiral has been halted. Militarily, the agreement to reduce the troop presence at these disputed border points, it represents a very significant step towards de-escalation. Whether there will be new buffer zones where both sides will withdraw their troops to prevent future conflicts, uh, like what happened in Galwan, will be spoken about by my eminent co-panelists. But all I'll say is that <clears throat> India must continue to enhance its military cap capabilities in response to China's increasing military power. And when I say military capabilities, it's not only the Indian Army, but the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, just two days ago, as far as what has actually happened is concerned, is that it has been reported that the PLS completely dismantled the temporary structures and pulled back to the pre-April 2020 positions. Patrolling is being conducted in Demchok as hitherto and is likely to resume in, in Depsang shortly. And the patrols will have, what was given to understand, will have full unrestricted access to the five patrolling points that were denied in uh, Depsang and the two in Demchok. And in fact, uh, what is even more important is that the patrols will be able to pass, go up to the Char Chardingla Pass which uh, that means our it's so important for our locals that our herders will also be able to go up there and take their uh, uh, yaks and their animals the goats up to that place now i've got two i mean i've got three excellent uh, co-panelists with me who are on ground people i'm just telling you the general area and what i've got from the media but I will never tire of repeating one old adage, which is actually a Russian proverb, but made famous by President Ronald Reagan, which says, trust but verify. 
we all are aware that the clash at Galwan happened because our troops went to a particular spot to see if the PLA had taken down the structures that they had put up earlier. Now they had not. So what happened? There was a verbal admonition by the commanding officer and he told the PLA guys, they got incensed. Then uh, apparently, I mean, from what one gathered, they hit the commanding officer, which incensed our troops. They came back with reinforcements. There was a clash. Now, this kind of situation, we must avoid going forward. Who led should prevail. And progress not only in the boundary issue, but in other domains. And uh, basically, there are three stages to this process in within the military. Uh, the first stage is disengagement. This is what is going on. Then will be de-escalation and then de-induction. As an ordnance man, all I'll tell you is that the winter is already setting in and our troops deployed there are well equipped and housed. I want to make your uh, the audience understand this very clearly. Stocks of food, clothing, equipment, fuel, ammunition, stores, everything would have been made up to the maximum quantities or numbers authorized as per our advanced winter stocking schedules. So while the entire process may, time, uh, may take time, the troops there would not be short of any essential commodity. I want to stress upon this. That said, the deinduction will always be um, taking uh, the same pace as a Chinese deinduction. In fact, if you recall the our deployments when we realized that the Chinese had come in and you know it was a lockdown time, COVID had to hit all over. Our deployments mirror the Chinese deployments. So similarly, I think our deinduction will mirror the Chinese deinductions. But just to assure the audience and everyone else. Uh, I can confidently say our troops are well equipped to last through the winter there, should the need arise that they continue to be in those places and step back gradually. Thank you, General Shankar. Back to you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks for your opening remarks. Uh, I think you made some very important points. Uh, but what I'd like to highlight is that while there are some details, the full details are not available to all of us what's happening yes. on ground that yes. we must uh, we must bear in mind uh, secondly we also have to understand this is not a deal or an agreement or a pact it is largely nothing is written we don't know what's written on uh, in paper between uh, the two governments or the two militaries whatever it is is a largely a matter of understanding that's what the impression at least i get uh, we don't have the third point which i'd like to highlight is whatever happens on the lac whether it's disengagement, whether it's de-induction or de-escalation or whatever you call it, will set the tone for the China-India relations in the future. And that is yes. why we are, you know, we are con concentrating on this. And the most talked about sector is the Denchok, Dutsang, Eastern Ladakh sector. So we'll start there. Uh, General Rakesh Sharma, sir, all yours. Uh, please focus on Eastern Ladakh. And if you can cover the central sector also, we'll be grateful. Thank you. All yours, sir. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, very interesting uh, panel, and you know there are great people sitting here, and I'm uh, in the awe already of good friends around here. I just make few points. Uh, please allow me. I absolutely agree with what General Shankar said. The fine print is not available. We do not know exactly what has happened, and let's not venture into issues and make uh, uh, commitments to the audience which we do not know about today. One commitment which I uh, wish to make is that there is no talk at all of Chardingla. Let's not talk word Chardingla at all. The media doesn't know and the media uh, and I uh, personally uh, do, uh, do not know myself, but I think uh, if they allow us to Chardingla, that will be going back on legacy issue. I go back to 2007-2008 when I was BJ Sops there. Uh, even those days, Chardingla was a very difficult patrol to take and there were major problems and I do not know what agreement has been arrived at Chardingla. We know about what's happened in Demsag, but nobody has spoken officially about the, what has happened in the area of Demchok, except that these two habitats that were, uh, that were created, uh, the encampments, Changa, whatever, the Champa camp, which was created near on the, uh, on the Demchok Nala has been dismantled and some patrolling is permitted. Where to, we do not. So let's not venture into that issue at all. Uh, second, uh, the issue I wish to raise is that WMCC has had 31 meetings from the time WMCC was raised. 
which was in 2013, not from 2020. 20 meetings of WMCC had happened between 2013 and 2020. Only 11 meetings have happened after 2020 and 21 meetings of the core commanders have taken place. So while we say 31 meetings you know, uh, uh, of WMCC, it is not exactly uh, that it has happened like that. WMCC meetings were continuing even prior to what happened in 2020. Third issue. Uh, while patrolling has commenced in the area of Depsang, and I, we, we do learn uh, um, authoritatively that some patrols have already taken place. Maybe helicopter recce, as General Pandu would have gone, I must have gone a number of times across to PP-13, landed there and come back. So we know the first uh, round of things would have been taken up by aerial ways to find out whether the, uh, the, the establishment habitat that has been established across and the patrolling routes between by junction to 9 and by junction to 13 and as they combine together all these intermediate things have been dismantled i'm sure they would have been dismantled we would have done the same thing on old side of bottleneck that is the third point which i wish to make that the first patrolling has taken place uh, some media report says they've gone to 30, 11 but let's deem it that and this is a long patrol establishes a patrol base it goes to two directions so it's a it's a difficult procedure to do it. Uh, how much has been done, one doesn't know, but something has begun. Fourth point I want to raise is that uh, presently we do not know what uh, we have permitted quid pro quo to the Chinese. We are all talking about ourselves as to what we have achieved. But undoubtedly, we have permitted Chinese also many things. How far they come there? now? Uh, we get a first tow hold into Depsang Plateau after this patrolling starts off. The all other excess route to Depsang Plateau, uh, which we used to patrol earlier, are now in buffer zone. So there is an issue there. But we have a now a, a foothold, at, at least a, a, a peek into the Depsang Plateau in this, uh, in this uh, area that we're going to patrol here. But what will the Chinese do? Uh, the, will Chinese send to Bursay? It's been spoken Chinese will send a patrol to Bursay, which they used to send often and there used to be a scuffles or clashes when that patrol used to come down to uh, to Burse. I'm also anxious that the Chinese will send, like to send a patrol to uh, uh, to, to Barahoti, to Mana, Malari, Niti and Shipkela passes. Uh, have they asked something from the central sector? There are uh, you know non-corroborated items that we have permitted patrolling to Yangtze or Asfila or one of these places in the east. Uh, how are we permitting them to come to Rakula in Sikkim? Where is the quid pro quo so that fine print is not available? And how are we going to monitor these patrols? I'm sure there's a scheduling thing carried out. Okay, you do patrolling tomorrow. I do it day after tomorrow or whatever this kind of schedules would have been come through. And that frequency would have been worked out. The number of people, the weapons to be carried. All this would have been worked out at the tactical level down from core below. And... Uh, duly approved at, at, at the right levels. But uh, how will we manage a patrol that comes down to, say, Bursay, I'm just saying, for example, because it comes down very close to the road that connects between uh, the uh, between the uh, the area of, uh, say, the road that comes off from uh, Shok village and it's driving up to, uh, uh, to, to DBO. As you drive out DBO, you cross Bursay port. So does it imply that, you know, the Chinese patrol will come down to the road that we have built across there? And are we going to escort such patrols? Are we going to escort patrols that come to Asfila or, or to, to Yangtze or wherever? So those are fine prints one doesn't know. I'm sure at the tactical level, things will be resolved here. The fifth point I, made, uh, I want to make is that the infrastructure largely created uh, outside the realms of the line of actual control. Firstly, line of actual control. We have patrolling points in the east. We have the issue of the, uh, as you are aware, the uh, the, the, the McMahon line, McMahon line, or whatever they call it. McMahon, McMahon, yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah and, it's okay. Right. Why did he spell himself uh -oh. wrongly? Mohan ho jata to acha hota. Mohan ho jata to acha hota. So, you know, that apart. Now, the issue which I'm raising is that there is a line that we deem a line. We always kept, uh, kept talking all these years about 
perceptions of the Chinese line. Chinese have not told us their line till date. I mean, they say 1959 line. 1959 line has no locus standi, no rationale, no legality, no no uh, thought process, no historicity. There is no basis of a 1959 line which comes on the base of, say, the, the hills of um, uh, in eastern Ladakh. So now the, the fact of the matter is somebody has to say, uh, you tell us your line here. Yeah? You know our line. You know 1 to 65 patrol points. Now it's common knowledge. Every drawing room knows in India, which is 1 to 55, 65 points. But we do not know the Chinese line. We talk about perception. We, till when we we'll keep, keep talking perceptions, sometime there should be a step forward to say, okay, no perception. We talk a line. Issue I was raising is about infrastructure. Now, G695, the road which has come now off, uh, and Shankar has also discussed once earlier about those bridges being made across and Pegongso Lake also, those big bridges which have come up across there, switching of forces. Now, that's all part of G695 they are building starting from Shaidullah right up to our Natural Pradesh to belong, which is about 10 to 15 kilometers from what we deem it as our line of actual control. And also, the runways have been increased to 5 kilometers, including Shigatse, including uh, Gari Gunza. All these runways have been included. They have been blast pens made. There are underground structures made. There are cantonments which have come up in Rudok and many other places. Large cantonments have come up. The fiber optic cable, the oil pipelines, and that and the retention of the forces there. So where is it that other than these two places that we have disengagement, where is it that there is a relaxation carried out for our troops to take a step back and say, okay, we can relax. I'll end. General Shankar, you must allow me. Uh, now, <laughs> go ahead, sir. The issue I wish to raise and I get worked up uh, is the issue of trust. Now, look, we trusted the Chinese often in our lives. You know, we trusted the Chinese for 20 years from 1993 to 2013 when he first time came and occupied an area for 22 days then he came and did when then Huda was army commander the areas of uh, of uh, tumor the five six battalion or units had to move across there in th those areas then it happened in Doklam and all these things been happening we gave our trust to the Chinese now we now units have drones I understand drones are flying across we are able to see Chinese drones are flowing on own side we have a much better uh, battlefield transparency that we used to have earlier. We also understand that there is a uh, thought process which started with the economic survey which said that the FDI, we should invite FDI into Chinese, from Chinese to India, then the trade will, must increase and so win-win situation for India and China in case economic activity interaction increases. Separate thing. We must do what we must do on the border. Shake hands, exchange gifts, exchange uh, some medicine, give them some sweets whenever do, play basketball, may take a two mouth eye or, uh, or two. But trust, I don't think we should venture into trust. Even establishment of trust, I don't think so. That trust and verify was suitable for uh, Reagan and Gorbachev in timing for dealing with nuclear issues where they said, okay, dismant dismantling of nuclear weapons, that uh, ABM treaties and the SALT talks and all that, you could do it. But here, there is an issue of sovereignty. Chinese call it not territorial integrity. They talk, talk about sovereignty. All good relations apart. I think we should not venture into the trust for quite some time before uh, uh, this. We should not enter into situations that can get problematic again and there will be problems. I'll rest here, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. I, uh, okay. Very General, good. General Shankar, General Shankar uh, one second. Just one clarification I, I want to make since uh, uh, what, uh, about what General Rakesh Sharma said. You see, I have uh, got my uh, issues updated only through open source and media. I have no, I want to clarify, I have no source anywhere else. Now, about Chardingla, this is an article of the Times of India of 2nd November, which says that the Indian Army is able to 
uh, go and patrol and would be able to patrol there and including grazing that will uh, occur. So it was a Times of India report that I have uh, using and nothing else. I just wanted okay, to make that point. No, no, Shankar, Shankar, I not rebutted. I'm just saying yeah, thank you. Chardingla was a pass, a patrol, which actually required the efforts of the complete unit to do so. It's a very tough mountaineering patrol. And the and the grazing ground was largely in Demchok Nala, up to CNN yeah. Junction. They were also not venturing forward towards Chardingla. I read the reports. I have seen the articles being written about Chardingla. I would, uh, and I know what used to happen when Chardingla patrols were being planned earlier, uh, even in years when I was BJS of Northern Command. And I will not venture to guess that the Chinese have permitted us to come to Chardingla till the time the official establishment says so. Sir. I will not believe absolutely, the media. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I completely I go with, agree. I, I defer to your experience and, uh, and knowledge. Yeah, let's go ahead. And hands on experience. There, there is no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, let me recount the major issues which uh, General Sharma has brought out. I, I think the very, uh, very relevant stuff. Chadingla, big question mark, uh, right? Because whether Chinese have allowed it or not, because I heard also that they have not allowed that. So I leave it at that. So it's a question mark. We leave it at a question mark. The issue of uh, quid pro quo, very, very important. So why, where have we given what the Chinese want and what did the Chinese want? And uh, what, what about the buffer zones? What's the future of the buffer zones? And that's something which I, right? Yeah. I'd like, uh, General Pannu, in your overall thing, you might like to address that. Then the issue of, you know, a word was used of escorted patrols. So what's the protocol for these escorted patrols? Well, the complicated things because we've not had this earlier. We've not had this earlier at all. Then, you know, we, sp we speak of schedules and, uh, you know, uh, protocols on the how to handle the LAC and all that. All these we've al always had. But over a period of time, they degenerate. How do you handle this in the long run is the challenge. And for that, you need trust which you don't have. And we are very clear on this. We can't trust them. As much as we don't trust them, they also don't trust us. That's the next point. And in case the Chinese don't trust anyone. So let's be very clear about it. They don't trust anyone. And we are in for a tough time, whether you like it or not. I and mean, whether we like it or not, we should prepare for that. OK. Now, another important thing is we all talk of perception of LAC. What's the Chinese perception of LAC? We don't know, right? And we just don't know. And that 1959 line depends on who, not only who's thought of it on the ground, which book you see, what you see, it, that perception also changes every by every page you turn. So it's a whole nebulous thing. We need to go step by step. We shouldn't get too excited about the whole affair. And whatever happens on the LAC is going to affect everything else. That's the important thing. And the major issue, the LAC has become formidable in depth. So we could do a bit of disengagement. I don't know whether we'll be able to do de-escalation. That's far away. That's my own view. And the issue of trust I've spoken and trade and all that, I don't think trade is... Trade also is very far away. Because if you read China, Chinese literature, especially in uh, media like Guancha, Erxian and all that, they're very clear they don't want to do any trade at this point of time. Right? At this point of time. They also are saying, look, first get the whole thing do. And they are looking at the whole issue geopolitically. But having said this, let's look at what's in store in the eastern sector and what are the perceptions in the eastern sector. Jal Dushant, all yours. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you. Uh, and very good evening to the panelists, sir. Uh, and uh, what I can say is that simply put, eastern, as far as the eastern sector is concerned, that was uh, more uh, as a... Uh, precautionary measure, everything went forward. Uh, reorientation had taken place, reorganization of uh, formations had taken place. Uh, those issues are not there in the uh, agreement. So, till how long our troops would be uh, there in that area, basically what we, were, we have been talking about, disengagement, etc. That is uh, something which we still need to uh, wait and watch as to what has exactly happened. In my view, I don't think anything uh, uh, on those issues has, has really been worked out. What I can say about Eastern is that there are uh, uh, 14, East, Eastern and Central uh, combined, there are about 14 points where our patrols normally have been either clashing or reaching out to meet out the uh, 
uh, the uh, PLA patrols. Uh, starting from the east, if you take certain sensitive areas of the uh, RALP, which is the rest of the Arunachal Pradesh area, there are those five valleys. In those five valleys, uh, more importantly, the fish tail areas. That was where we used to have uh, uh, PLA patrols coming inside our territory, and uh, we would normally react to it based on certain intelligence and inputs which we used to get. I believe the uh, the surveillance and intelligence inputs have improved, but not to the extent as we, uh, as compared to the Chinese. If you see the 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 kind of intelligence that the Chinese enjoy in this particular area, basically because of their space and uh, other. Uh, technological uh, uh, asymmetry which, which they have, uh, we are still reacting to any such kind of patrol uh, in the past. I don't think uh, uh, anything has been worked out on those in the in that area. Similarly, we have the Maza, Biza area and the lower Subansari area. There also we had very long distances to travel to meet uh, or uh, meet up with these uh, Chinese patrols which used to come, uh, come, uh, come across the LAC as per our perception. Uh, one interesting thing which I would like to tell uh, as, as regards patrolling is concerned. In the eastern sector, we have never ever crossed over the uh, the, uh, the the LAC as far as, as, far as our perception is uh, concerned, the watershed. Whereas uh, in the case of the, the PLA, they have been crossing at number of uh, places which are now termed as disputed areas. So these out of these 14, I think, Two are important for us. We don't know how far how far the agreement would uh, affect this particular area, that is Fistail 2, and uh, in the lower Subanshri area, where we have to travel a lot still. Infrastructure still needs a uh, needs a kind of additional development. Roads have to go go forward. As far as uh, your Tawang uh, uh, area is concerned, uh, Chinese are somehow fixated with Yangtze, and that is one area I would. I, I, I would feel that in the future could become a major trouble spot. So I think uh, there also there would be some kind of friction taking place as to how we are going to deal with the uh, incursions with the Chinese continue to have. And that generally they come in large numbers. These patrols are more or so of force, you know, 200 people, 300 PLS soldiers coming across to that Yangtze Nala and then we reacting to it and trying to push them back. It has happened after Galwan also, if you all remember 2022. Uh, 22 Yangtze. October 22. Yeah, October 22 when Yangtze. So even now, what I have gathered is that the Chinese are really, really uh, sensitive to the Yangtze area. So <laughs> that is one flashpoint which we need to uh, uh, watch out as to what arrangements have been done at that particular place. Other than that, I don't think in uh, in the uh, Tamang sector there is any major issue which uh, which would uh, which would come up. As for my opinion. If you go to the uh, Sikkim area, there, again, the area of Dolam, uh, which we nowadays call as Doklam, uh, Dolam area is where the, the Chinese patrols used to come right up to Jamf area. So that is one place where we have to keep a very uh, close watch. We are not sure whether they have resumed or we have allowed them to do uh, patrolling up to that. In any case, that area is not part of us. It's a uh, Bhutanese territory. So therefore, or what is happening to those patrols? Uh, at least I am not very clear about it. Nothing has been said in the uh, uh, in the open source, so I really can't commit whether uh, it is business as usual. That means the patrols, the way they were they were coming uh, in the past, are they going as per that? Uh, one is not very sure. Although uh, Torsa Nala, which is ahead of the Damferi Ridge, is considered by and large as uh, you can say uh, as the line where beyond which we start reacting. That is, you know. Uh, uh, even from the Indian side, we start uh, raising the uh, Bhutanese people to not allow these people to come across. But they have built by they have built roads around uh, this area to go further into the uh, Chumbi Valley. Uh, as far as Nakula and Mugutang is concerned, these are the other two flashpoints. Uh, Nak uh, Nakula is on the plateau, and uh, so these areas, I don't think there is any major issue. Uh, uh, and uh, it's more of a it's more of a uh, I would say a very routine kind of a thing. It was, in fact, a, uh, in fact, Nagula was actually a uh, sorry, the plateau was actually a flag uh, uh, flag meeting point. In fact, although it has been stopped uh, uh, for quite some time now, now uh, nowadays there are no flag meetings taking place except for Nagula, which uh, remains. 
in fact we'll also have to uh, check out as to whether the flag meetings are taking place along the uh, eastern uh, command sector or not i don't think anything of that nature has taken place for quite some time uh, if you look at uh, then uh, the uh, central sector central sector also uh, similar uh, situation is there patrolling issues have not come across so uh, my, my opinion is that as far as eastern and the central sector is concerned it is about disengagement of the additional troops which have been deployed there and uh, uh, as far as the reorientation of forces are concerned that will continue i don't think we are going to let down on the uh, on the various reorganizations which we have done of the forces overlooking this particular sector from uh, central right up to the eastern uh, sector that is from chumar right up to the tri junction of uh, china uh, myanmar in this particular sector whatever additional deployments which we have done reorientation which we have done either in the depth or immediate depth or in the uh, reserve areas that is going to continue unless and until we have some kind of a very 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 uh, i would say but nowadays you can't even trust any agreement you know the way these people are uh, breaking agreements which we have been having in the past uh, my sense is that the deployment is going deployments are going to stay only thing which might happen is that you know there would be some amount of disengagements taking place probably going back to the pre 2020 uh, uh, time frame of uh, having the quantum of people deployed in the forward areas as far as these sectors are concerned one third is what is normally accepted uh, by uh, norms that one third of the troops would be there in the uh, border areas and rest of them remain in their uh, permanent uh, location and move up uh, move up during the opulent time uh, to build up the uh, situation so eastern and central to my mind are going to be postured only remain postured the flash points which are there chumar is another one where we might have some kind of a, a, a detailed coordination on ground for patrolling this this concept of escorted patrols coordinated patrols did not exist in eastern eastern sector at all this was not there i mean uh, the 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 pla would come on their own we would go on go go on our own we would obliterate their uh, their signs etc which they used to leave behind and likewise they would obliterate our signs whichever we left behind as far as indicating that to be our territory except in certain areas like bisa majo uh, bisa area etc where where there is some amount of clashes which take place so uh, from the eastern uh, sector my my sense is the deployments which additional increment uh, increments which have been done they will continue to stay patrolling would uh, possibly resume to the pre 2020 era because uh, there were really no major uh, flash points except what i told you about the jamferi area fistel area the uh, and yangse yangse area these are and chumar of course because chumar earlier was part of the uh, you know uh, part of the northern uh, sector but now it has come as part of the central so central is now actually chumar up to uh, up to the uh, the uh, that is nepal border so 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 uh, that is the only change uh, in my view it will be uh, it will be a precautionary deployment continued unless we have some very very concrete agreements on disengagements and uh, uh, deescalation right. and disengagements okay thanks thanks a lot general dushant i think you covered a lot of ground uh, the points which i would like to highlight is that look <laughs> the level of disagreement in the eastern sector is not as much as in the uh, northern sector or the western sector or eastern ladakh but they are there important fishtail fishtail is a place where we are very severely hampered by the our inability to reach in time because of road conditions and the soil conditions the soil conditions there are so poor that even a one ton going over to a two ton going over tracks marginal tracks can collapse it's a soft soil whereas on the other side things are slightly better especially because they have a road which rings the ridge around the fish tails that i mean i'm talking of my personal experience uh, there then of course yangze yangze is a very critical point like what general dushan said uh, we'll have to see because there's certain uh, unauthenticated uh, versions of things coming out but what is the fine print what is the actual thing we need to know and uh, hopefully in due course something will clearly emerge but we need to take care of it then the issue of 
you know sikkim what i'd like to highlight about sikkim and the lac sikkim is really not an lac it's actually a delineated border there's border that was delineated between sikkim Correct. and uh, you know uh, tibet long back okay yes. much before we even sikkim became independent uh, i mean uh, joined with india right and we recognize uh, before we recognize tibet as part of china so it's almost a delineated border there's no uh, uh, scope of their incursion there if they're incursing they're incursing against the in, uh, international border right uh, that's what i want to make of course the issue of doklam will continue and we'll talk of it in the next this thing so with this uh, thanks a lot important issues like brought out i would like yeah. to add one more point here when we look at the eastern sector we must not forget the dispute with bhutan because now what yeah, happened i'll come to that no, i'm coming to that i'll ask you this question yeah yeah i'll ask you this question this is a, the question which i have for your next round okay okay, okay. um uh, okay thanks thanks a lot uh, jal pannu all yours please give a overview as to what the whole story you you you, you heard your own core what jal uh, rakesh had said and then what general dushan please give us a overview about the whole affair all yours thank you uh, general shankar and uh, dal murthy um it was great this thing to general sharma and uh, my friend dushan um india and china have a very special relationship which cannot be understood either by the world or i think by india and by china both so <laughs> our entire uh, understanding is that it appears that there is a strategic necessity for the china to keep the boundary disputed and they want to keep it disputed basically to contain india uh, to the asian uh, region rather than trying to or making an attempt to become a global player so whatever the chinese do they want to build peace at will and bring aggression at will so i think um whatever the chinese do they do how they want to do when they want to do now going back to the two uh lines of history the which you can divide actually before 1962 um how the chinese walked into tibet and the british had already marked a few lines and they did not give a line to india so therefore uh indians drew a line which was along uh the maximum line uh which was the johnson line and we said entire excise chain belongs to india um in 1955 of course the western highway was built and it was discovered that they had built a highway um while the highway and our claim to the entire excise chain became a very big political embarrassment uh to india because a that whatever you think is india is not india and the chinese have already come into it on the other side of course was the pok so therefore the status of jnk uh, on one side disputed and claimed by pakistan um, i think there is a historical fault line there that none of these were given to india as the international border and we marked it on our own and there was no understanding between india uh, stroke tibet or india stroke china as to where the boundaries would lie and therefore i think right from day one the push and pull strategy um the perception creation and misperception creation but i think constantly at play and of course in 1959 we all know that the lai lama came to india and we have been keeping the lai lama much to the dislike of uh, uh, the chinese and he's a religious head he's also a political head because they established a government in exile here much to the dislike of the chinese so then of course came 1962 in 1962 of course we know what happened but also we know that the chinese went back on their own so it means one thing to be noted is that the chinese came on their own they did whatever they had to do we fought the way we wanted to fight or we could fight or wherever we could push ourselves into it but they fell back on their own they did not there was no understanding that hey we will be having a ceasefire and 